Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to start with a question, and the question is this Are you ready? Are you ready? For Christmas, that is. Some of you have uh, been getting for ready for some time uh, in terms of the decorations and all that go. Uh, maybe you're one of those persons in your neighborhood who have uh, their lights were out way before Halloween. Anybody? Any, raise your hand if you're an early bird. We have an early bird back there. Okay, all right. Uh, anybody else want to admit to it? How many of you are... Post-Halloween, pre-Thanksgiving people. Anybody post-Halloween, pre-Thanksgiving? Raise your hand if there's some decorations out. All right. Let's go ahead and admit, inside or outside on this one, okay? All right. Okay, a few more hands come up. Okay. How many of you are purists, like myself, and you wait until after Thanksgiving to, uh, to get your decorations up? Raise your hand. All right. Now, put your hands down. How many of you have not put a lick of decorations up yet? Look at those hands, I tell you. Listen, you got four Sundays. I mean, come on, you're, you got plenty of time, plenty of time. You know, it's amazing, uh, you know, in our neighborhood, there's a couple of houses that had lights, lights already up really, really early. Uh, and, I, and maybe you have somebody in your neighborhood who's, who is like that. Uh, they're the early bird. But, you know, we do those things to get ready for Christmas. We, we put out lights uh, on the eaves of our houses or if you're like me, you put them down low where it's safe to, to, to do so, uh, and you put them along the sidewalk. Some of us put garland out on our uh, 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 fireplaces or, or uh, lights that intermix with those. Some of us have uh, uh, nativity scenes that we have out on tables in our homes or, or, uh, or gingerbread cookie villages or whatever it may be that you have on this table or, or that table. For many, it's, it's uh, 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 traditional things that you you put out I can remember as a kid my mom in the kitchen we had all the traditional decorations out but this one thing in particular still haunts me to this day uh, and, and she occasionally will throw it back out and we'll, all of us boys and my sister kind of go Ugh. it was this a uh, 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 little elf uh, that was uh, had a string to it and she'd hang it in the kitchen and you'd pull the string and it would play Christmas music but it was the creepiest elf in the entire world 
I, we just, ugh. But, but so everybody has something, you know. There's all kinds of decorations because we're all getting things ready in our houses. Some of us put out a few decorations here and there. Some of us put out decorations as if we're on steroids. Uh, and they're everywhere, every nook and cranny. Some of us put out one tree, and that's good enough. Some of us put out six trees, eight trees, a dozen trees. Anybody more than 12? Raise your hand if you're brave. Uh, I see someone pointing to someone over there. Okay, I won't, I won't highlight anyone. But some of us go all out to get ready for the season. You know, this morning's Scripture passage speaks of a time when, when Mary was getting ready for something very important. She was getting ready for something miraculous, the birth of her firstborn child, someone who was very special and unlike any other child, the one who would be Savior, the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure Mary was quite shocked at first when, when the birth announcement came the way it did with the angel's presence saying, you will be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and you will give birth to the Savior of the world. Now, who wouldn't be surprised? I mean, she hadn't planned on having a child this soon. She was not officially married at this point. She was betrothed. It's a little different than our engagement period, but it's not too far off. It's somewhere between being married and engaged, but it's still a big deal. It's not the time to have a child. And so you can imagine how there was shock in her eyes uh, when the angel came to say, you will be with child. It's time to get ready. At first, Scripture says she was quite troubled by this, but by the end of it all, we are amazed by Mary's faith when she says to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. You know, getting ready for a, a baby and getting ready for Christmas aren't exactly the same things. There's all kinds of different things that take place when you're getting ready for a baby. In fact, there's a lot more to it if you really sit down to think about it, especially that birthing part, so I'm told. It's a getting ready for something even more greater. There are all kinds of things that young parents do to get ready for the birth of their child. They go to Target, they go to Walmart, they go to Baby Toys R Us or whatever it may be, whatever the hip new store is, and they get their registry. But Mary didn't have anything like that. Joseph didn't get to play with a little machine gun thing, you know, and go beep, beep on all the scan codes. It, uh, did y'all do that? I did that. I thought that was fun. They had a little, little gun thing you could scan and say, we want that on our registry. We want that on our registry. We want... They didn't have that sort of a thing. I bet that the, the synagogue that they attended probably didn't throw them a baby shower because they probably didn't do those kinds of things to get ready for the coming of a baby. They had so much to get ready for in order to celebrate the birth of the Savior, but it didn't involve lights, it didn't involve trees, it didn't involve wreaths. It was more about making clothes. Uh, it was more about establishing a home. Uh, for them, it was about getting married. Uh, there was lots of things that went into getting ready for the birth of the Christ child. You know, at Christmas we celebrate the birth of the Christ child fresh and anew in our lives as we seek to celebrate the birth of our Savior, our Lord, the one we call upon, our Savior. The temptation, however, for all of us is to get caught up in, in everything else that goes along with Christmas and everything secular that goes along with Christmas these days as well. The temptation is to get caught up in the secular aspects of a holiday and miss the sacredness of a holy day. Let me say that again. The temptation for all of us is, is to get caught up in the secular aspects of a holiday and miss the sacredness of this holy day. Sure, there's nothing wrong with, with the secular aspects of things. I'm not saying that Jesus gets mad at you when you put your Christmas lights up. I'm not saying He, he frowns on you when you buy presents for, for your loved ones. It's not that way. But it's easy if we let it for Christmas as the world presents it, to steal Christmas as Jesus would have it. We must be mindful not to let the consumerism of Christmas to consume us and to keep us from celebrating the birth of our Savior. So here's my question to you for this season. And my question is this. 
How will you prepare yourselves to celebrate afresh and anew the birth of the Christ child in your hearts and in your life this season? In the church, we do that in a very intentional way. We call it Advent. Trying to avoid getting consumed by the commercialization and, and consumerism of Christmas is a real challenge, but focusing on Advent, as we do in the church, is a way of, of being intentional in our lives. So that as Christmas approaches, we don't just happen upon it, or we don't just happen to get lost in all of the decorations and miss the baby that was born on our behalf. Focus on Advent helps us to spiritually prepare ourselves to celebrate Jesus and His birth. Now, you may or may not realize this, but in the Christian world, Advent is the beginning of the Christian year. Uh, the Christian year goes uh, through, uh, uh, through Pentecost and Christ the King Sunday and Lent and Easter and all those things starts with Advent. So, Happy New Year! We begin something fresh and something new, and we do that in Advent. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, meaning appearing, or as Deirdre has said this morning to the children, coming. It's used in, in back then in days of the secular world. They would use it as a, as a word to indicate the coming of a king into a community or, or coming of a king into his, to, uh, his, his throne room. It was the advent of the king being uh, uh, you know, crowned or whatever it may be. In the Christian usage of the word, it refers specifically to the king of kings, the appearing or the coming of Christ. Historically, the coming of Christ has been celebrated in two ways. As, as uh, you may remember, some of you growing up early uh, in, uh, in life, you may remember people talking, pastors talking about Advent not only being the coming of the Christ child, but also historically we've talked about the second coming of Christ. So not only does it celebrate the, the first coming with the birth, but, but also we talk about how Christ will return one day as judge and as Lord, and He will uh, come and, and bring home those who have placed their faith in Him. So there is a first appearing and a second appearing. Uh, the season of Advent has its origins in France and Spain in the 4th and 5th centuries. In 380 A.D., the Council of Sarasota, uh, Saragossa uh, urged faithful Christians to attend each year, every day, from December 17th all the way through Epiphany, which is about 12 days after the, the Christmas Day, which we, where we get the old 12 days of Christmas song. Well, that, there actually was a 12 days of Christmas. Christmas season for the church historically is not now. This is Advent. Christmas season doesn't start until Christmas Day and goes through Epiphany. And so historically, there was this season that was celebrated. Early calendars in both the East and West indicated as part of that preparation for Christmas, a 40-day period of, of fasting. Now think about this for a second. Historically, Advent was a time of fasting. It was akin, if you would, to what we do with Lent and Easter. Lent is that 40-day period of preparing our hearts to celebrate Easter in our lives. Advent, historically, has been the same way. Although it has changed in, 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 in over the years, that's what it was. It, it was, a, it was as the, the pattern of the church was to, to fast first and then feast second. So we would fast and prepare our hearts to celebrate the Feast of Christmas, or we would fast, and fast during the time of Lent and celebrate the Feast of Easter. The world, however, has gotten things backwards. We feast first, and then we go on a diet afterwards, right? We are here to prepare ourselves. We are here to get ready to celebrate you see, Advent is this season of quiet anticipation. It's this season of expectation, of celebrating what will be. The one who once came in humility by way of Bethlehem's manger, a humble donkey, and made his way to Calvary's cross. The one who today comes to us through his holy word and through the sacrament of his body and blood, which we will celebrate here in just a few moments, will come visibly one day in glory at his second coming. The tone of Advent is not meant to be depressing, but rather of joyful expectation, of preparation of heart that is full of expectant joy, like a mother to be waiting 
on the birth of her child as Mary awaited for the birth of Jesus. You know, Advent has with it its own customs and traditions that we have historically followed and practiced within the church. The most common of which, the most known of which, is the one right here to my left and your right, the Advent wreath. This wreath symbolizes so many things. It is it, it, typically covered with, with evergreens, uh, which uh, symbolize the eternity of, of, of life, that this eternal life that God offers us, because evergreens are green throughout the year. Most Advent wreaths are done in a circle, indicating some, a circle that has no beginning and no end, which indicates the eternity of God, the, the everlasting no beginning, no end of who God is in our lives. The, the lights of the candles represent each of the days of Sundays, each of the Sundays leading up to Christmas, the, day, the Sundays of Advent, which get brighter and brighter as we get closer and closer to Christ. And the evergreens main, remain fresh and alive even as the dead of winter comes our way. And so, as Jesus tells us his, in His promise in John chapter 11, He says, I am the resurrection of the life. And he that believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Just as evergreens and the lights remind us of the light of Christ, which transforms our lives and provides for us a way into eternity with God, so Jesus offers us this great reminder and the beauty of the evergreen. Each successful week leads us down this pathway as we reach Christmas Eve where we light the center candle, a reminder of Christ being born in the world. The intent of Advent is not to take the fun out of Christmas, but to restore a joy and a celebration in our hearts as we prepare ourselves to remember not holidays, but holy days. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of these guys that's going to boycott some store because they said holiday. But let it be for you a reminder of what the core root of that word is. It's not just a holiday. It's a holy day when God tiptoed out of heaven and was born a tiny baby to a peasant couple when he humbled himself to be for us ultimately a sacrifice for our lives. Advent helps us get ready for Christmas. So I return to my original question, which is how will you prepare yourself to celebrate afresh and anew the birth of the Christ child in your heart and in your, your life this Advent season? In other words, how are you going to make Advent intentional for you and your family? Well, let me offer you three ways to do that real quickly. The first of which is what we've already been talking about, and it's this. Join us for worship each Sunday during the Advent season. Now, the average worship attendance for people who consider themselves faithful attenders of church is 1.3 Sundays a month. That's a sad statistic. Let's not let that statistic be true this Advent season. I want to challenge each and every one of you to make worship a priority, a habit this Advent season so that when you reach Christmas Day, you are truly ready for that joining together in worship of the christ child during the advent season reminds us what christmas is all about it's an opportunity to to recalibrate our compass if you will if you have a compass and it leads to points to true north so that no matter what direction you're going you can tell there is true north and if you want to follow christ you can point your compass to true north what happens when we get out into this world what happens in the busyness of this season is that the the magnets of consumerism the magnets of of of, of all the worldliness of things the 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 the, the, the the stress of it all is like putting magnets up next to our compass. And what does a magnet do next to a compass? It makes that, that, uh, that needle just spin around. These are false true norths, if you would. When we come to worship, we put those magnets off to the side. And we put them in their proper place. And we allow the compass of Christ to point us in the right direction. You will get torn hither and yon. You will be distracted. Even more so because the enemy wants you to be during the Advent season. So make church a priority so that you can look at your compass on Sunday and say, yes, 
I am getting in the right direction again. I am headed in the right direction again. My heart has been renewed from having worshipped the Lord together with others. That's number one. How do we get ready? Let's talk about number two. A second way to spiritually prepare ourselves for Christmas is to follow Jesus' example of humility. Jesus came and took on human form. Think about that for about two seconds and you're blown away. Here is the God of the universe, the creator of it all, the one who knit us together in our mother's womb, taking on the form of a child. And it wasn't just an image or a symbol or it wasn't just some sort of uh, magic trick. No, God put on flesh and dwelt among us. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, any common sharing in His Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, in humility like Christ, value others above yourself looking not to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. What was that mindset? Humility. Jesus, who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. Rather, He made Himself what? Nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant. And being made in human likeness. Jesus, who was 100% divine, put on 100% humanity. Not losing either one. Was born. Allowed himself to to be this humble baby. He didn't come in, you know, and open the door as the 30-year-old and say, all right, let me start teaching you about what God wants for you. Instead, he allowed himself to become a helpless baby be raised by a a young peasant couple to show a humility to the world. Christ invites us into this same humility, the same humility that washes feet and and, and helps the lepers and, and serves the poor to make a difference in the world around them. If Christ can humble Himself to make a difference in the world, why don't we humble ourselves this season to make a difference in someone else's life? What that looks like is up to you. Or really, we should say, it's up to God. But if you'll pray, He'll show you what that is. Whether it's volunteering at the mission house, whether it's, it's going to Tyler and helping with church under the bridge, whether it's, it's helping with an angel tree uh, for a kid, or, or helping some, a neighbor in need, a, a raking leaves or mowing lawns, whatever it may be. How are you going to emulate and follow after the example of the humility of Christ? Find one way and make Advent meaningful that way. Here's number three. Make the Christmas story central to your Advent and Christmas. Make the story of the birth of Christ as it's laid out in the Gospels central to this season and this time in your life. Matthew, Luke, and John each tell a different part of the Christmas story. Take time to dig into these scriptures. Live into the life of Christ and His birth. Let this be a part of who you are. Soak in it. Read the passages over and over again. Find ways to to make that a part of your Christmas tradition. For our family, it's always involved what we call the Advent book. It was a gift that was given to us. It's this very thick, hard book. It's beautiful. But as you open up every day during Advent, there's a different page with different beautiful doors on them. And you can open up those doors, and inside is a different verse as part of the Christmas story. For our family, that's been a wonderful tradition, a wonderful way of getting the Word of God, centering us on the story of Christ during the Advent season. So every day, a different door is opened up, and every day, a different part of the story is read. What are you going to do? 
Maybe it's, uh, it's uh, doing your own Advent wreath and having, Christmas, uh, having Scripture readings as part of that with your family. Maybe for you, it's on Christmas Eve, getting everyone to gather together and read the story of Christ's birth from the Gospels. Or maybe you do that on Christmas morning. Whatever it is, center yourself on God's Word. And center yourself on the story that changes us. You know, it's not too late if, to get ready for Christmas. Uh, if you don't have your lights up yet, you can still do that. If you don't have your tree up yet, you can still do that too. But let me also encourage you to not forget. As we begin this Advent season, to also get your heart ready. To get your heart ready by joining us for worship to get your heart ready by finding something you can do to be a blessing to another in a humble way, and by finding a way to incorporate the story, the real story of Christmas in your heart and life and in your family's heart and life and in your children's heart and life. And then we will be celebrating together. Amen? Amen.